So the first thing I want to do tonight was just an overview of the book of Joshua, just so we're, you know, we, we, this is kind of a flyby, though. I mean, we're not going to take a lot of time with this. Tom went over it last week, and I think it's important to do. I was glad to hear that he did it. Um, so first of all, and we're going to actually look at these scriptures. One thing that I haven't always done when I taught is actually have you turn to the scriptures. But I think it's important that you know where you are in God's word, where you need to be in God's word, and generally speaking, begin to get a sense for what's where. So turn to Deuteronomy 34. If you don't know where Deuteronomy is, I will be happy to tell you that. Okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy 34. I'm going to stay up here where the light's brighter. <laughs> so so uh, the book of Joshua spans the time from Moses' death to Joshua's death. Okay, that's the time frame. So Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses uh, 7, verse 7. And if you're not there and you really need to be there or you want to be there before I start reading, holler. Otherwise, I'll sort of proceed at a reasonable pace. Deuteronomy 34, 7, okay? Hey, Denny, how are you? And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Now, we're not going to talk about that, but catch the last part of that verse. 120 years old, eye was not dim, natural force was not abated. Um, you can look up the word natural force, but um, the Hebrew word sort of means freshness or vigor. Now, this was a guy that just went through 40 years with the children of Israel in the wilderness, and he was now 120, and his vigor was not abated when he died. <laughs> That is a teaching in itself. However, we're not going to go there. Uh, verse 9. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him as, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Okay, so I'm just pointing out, you can think about those verses. Moses was a great man. I mean, he talked to God face to face. That's what the Bible says. But back to our subject. The book of Joshua spans the time from when Moses died. He literally went up on Mount Nebo, which you, if you look at a map, I don't have any maps tonight, but if you look at a map, it's right in the area where the children of Israel first came into the Promised Land before they crossed the Jordan. It's in the, on that side of the Jordan, on the east side of the Jordan. Anyway, let's go to, send the, it goes to the death of Joshua. Turn to Joshua chapter 24. It's the last chapter of Joshua. Joshua chapter 24. And if any of you would like to read, I encourage you to do that. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to read, um, raise your hand, say I'd like to read, do something. We'll have some longer passages. These are single verses and I can read them. But if you want to read, I encourage you to do that. Um, as you are in our church, and you're first attending, and then hopefully serving, you know, sparkle first, but then maybe other things as well, you may, um, it may work in your heart to become, to have more responsibility in service. So the next step for a man might be a deacon, okay? And then a next step might be an elder, and maybe an assisting pastor. You know, assisting pastors start out sitting in a chair, listening to whoever's on stage. So that could happen to you as well, okay? So you may, at some point, be teaching the Bible, in which case you need to be comfortable reading the Bible out loud. So if you want to start that, holler. Okay. So Joshua chapter 24, verse 29. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. There you go. They're 10 years old. They were long-lived, huh? Okay, so Book of Joshua spans that time frame. You may, um, I shared when I uh, taught Joshua chapter 1 that the Book of Joshua spans about 17 years. Some people give it a few more than that, up to maybe 25. But the, the book itself, from when we read in Joshua chapter 1, be strong and of a good courage. You know, Moses, my servant, is dead. Be strong and of a good courage. You're going to take him in. You're going to divide the land to the children of Israel. From that time to the end of the book when he dies, 17 years. Just a reminder, okay, so we see God, um, as we read the Bible, working in human history in different ways at sort of 
different levels of presence, if you know what I mean. And from the time of the Exodus, when he gets Moses in the wilderness and he sends him into Egypt and he says, you're going to bring my people out, right? So from that time, when they go out in the wilderness, they get to the point of the promised land, remember. They send the spies in. The spies come back. We can't do this. He says, okay, fine. And we'll read about that. Okay, fine. You guys will die in the wilderness. I'll take your kids in. You wandered for 40 years. So there's 40 years there. And then, let's say, 17 years for Joshua. So that 65, 70 years, oh, uh, no, I'm over 60 years, okay, is probably, other than Jesus Christ's ministry on the earth, when he was actually as the Son of God on the earth, probably the most active time you see God working. I'm not saying he doesn't work other times, but in that time, it's just off the charts, just off the charts, what he is doing to bring his people out of slavery in Egypt into the promised land that he will read, that he, by the way, promised to Abraham 500 years before this happened, right? That was the original promise to Abraham. First time we read of Abraham in Genesis 12, he gets promised the promised land. I'm going to give you this land. He's in the land of Canaan. We'll read it. 500 years before it actually happens. But that 60 years, oh my goodness, it's just off the charts, what he does to bring his people out of slavery and into the promised land. Okay, let's uh, go on. So we talked about that. Um, the sections of the book, just in general, these, again, this is a flyby. From chapters 1 through chapter 12 is the conquest of the land. Okay? If you read, we're not going to read it, but if you read in chapter 12, it names specifically 31 kings that they conquered. 31 of them. It names them all, such and such, one, such and such, one, 31. It names them all. That's chapter 12. So the first 12 chapters are conquest. Thir chapter 13 through chapter 22 is the dividing of the land. Joshua actually says, okay, you get this, you get that, you get this, et cetera, et cetera. He does that through 22. Then 23 and 24 are kind of a, sort of an epilogue. I mean, that's an English word we might use. It's, it's Joshua's addresses personally before his death to the children of Israel in chapter 23. And then again, and he addresses them again in 24 immediately before he dies. Okay, so, and I'm, I'll be sharing, I have the good fortune to share from Joshua 24, so we'll talk about that then, but um, bottom line is the sad part about Joshua 24, it's a great chapter, uh, great memory verses. You know, you see that one, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see that all over the place. But the reason he had to say it is because there was still idolatry going on, and we'll read about that another time. That's not, we're not going to study that tonight. Okay, so the chapters themselves, just again, a flyby for what we've been looking at so far. Chapter 1, Moses, my servant, is dead. You know, be strong and of good courage. He's, and God specifically encourages Joshua along those lines. Chapter 2 was Rahab and the spies that they sent in. Okay. Chapters 3 and 4 is crossing the Jordan. The, the children of Israel, remember numbers? We, we looked at, there was a census done just before um, Moses died. It's in Numbers 26. And he, the, the number of Israel, of men, you know, of, of um, giborim is the Hebrew word, mighty men, you know, so to speak, over 20 and can fight, was over 600,000. So the, amount, the number of Israelites that we're talking about that crossed the Jordan is probably like a million and a half, or at least a million people. And again, from when I shared in Joshua 4, the section of the, I believe it was Joshua Ford, the section of the river, of the Jordan River, that if you remember, he dried up the Jordan River, right? God dries up the Jordan River. As I said, the miracles are just off the charts. So it tells you from what city to what city it was dry, that he dried it up. If you look at that, the, the best um, location, it, it was the town called Adam, okay? The best location that we have for that town down to about the Jericho level, it was 16 miles of river that was dry. And a million people are crossing that river. So, again, that's what happens in chapter 3 and chapter 4. You have to, um, some of these details you have to look at to realize the magnitude of what God is doing here. It's just, it is believably unbelievable. I mean, wow, holy moly. And if you're in the land of Canaan and you see this happening, you're going to be shaking in your boots, which we see. Uh, you know, last uh, week when Tom shared about... Uh, G Gibeon, I got the I'm, I'm spacing on the name, and the um, they sent uh, ambassadors, you know, to make peace with the Israelites. Say, well, we're from a far country, we just want to make peace with you guys. 
They did it because they were scared out of their wits of this, you know, this army, seeing them cross and doing what they had done to people so far. So, okay, chapter uh, 5, you, mem- you may remember chapter 5 was the recircumcision of the nation. Um, remember the, the Giborim, the mighty men. They died in the wilderness. So all the youngsters, they weren't circumcised in the wilderness. So when they get to the promised land, they're not circumcised. God says, okay, that's part of the covenant. You've got to recircumcise them. You may remember from reading that, it refers to a hill, H-I-L-L, hill of foreskins. Guess why? There were several hundred thousand. Okay? How about, how's that for graphic? Okay, then um, in Joshua 5, you may remember too, manna finally stopped. Okay, until Joshua chapter 5, from the time they first went into the wilderness, 40 years, they got manna to eat, miraculously, six days out of seven. They didn't get it on the seventh day because God told them you can't, you know, you don't gather. So they got six days out of seven, they got manna until Joshua chapter 5 is when it stopped. And then the appearance of the captain of the Lord's army uh, to Joshua at the end of the chapter. Jo- uh, six is conquest of Jericho. Seven was Ai, the city of Ai, and Achan's sin when they tried to capture it. And eight was the taking of Ai. And then last week, Tom shared about Gibeon's ambassadors, and they make a league. You know, they, it says they worked craftily or wilily, and they make a league with Israel knowing that that was the only way they were going to survive. So that's what they did. All right, so that's what we've done so far. Now, let's just read Joshua chapter 10. Okay? We're just going to read through the whole chapter. Um, and again, if anybody wants to read, you're, you are welcome to do that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Joshua chapter 10, verse 1. Now came to pass when Adonai the king of Jerusalem had heard how Joshua was taken to Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and his king, so he had done to Ai and his king. And how the inhabitants of Gibeon were made peace with them and were among them, that they feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities.
this not written in the book of Jacob? So the son took his needle and went to the and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. Mike, you okay? Keep it, you want to read? You want to continue? Okay. No, no. You you want to continue? If you do, fine. If somebody else wants to, fine. Steve, go ahead. Pick it up in verse 15. Oh, I apologize. 14. I apologize. There was, yeah. there was no day like that before or after that the Lord hearkened. Hearkened? I'm not sure what you have. Yeah. Makita. Good. Akita. Good. Lakish. Libna, Libna. Lakish?
Barnea, Kadesh Barnea. Okay, thank you both for reading. Um, so, there are a lot of historical details in here, which we're probably actually going to look at next week not this week. We're going to take a little bit of a different tack because what we're going to look at is, um, you know, Israel had, well, let's, let's look at a couple things related to Israel's promised land, okay? Turn to Joshua chapter 12. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12, we'll see where the, this promised land that they are now conquering was first promised to Abraham. And this is about... 2000 BC or so, as far as we can tell from biblical chronology. Old Testament biblical chronology is not an exact science. We can't tell a specific year, but we can, you know, get it close. So this was about 2000 BC, Joshua chapter 12, verse, uh, we'll start in verse 5. Uh, Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. That's what the promised land is referred to as. <clears throat> and go into the land of Canaan. They came, and Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So that was the first time this promised land was promised to Abraham, who was, again, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel, that's who eventually gets into Egypt, right, As, that are slaves in Egypt, okay, the 12 sons of Israel. Let's look at a couple other things related to this. So the, the exodus, as I mentioned, the exodus, when they're coming out of slavery and going into the promised land is about 500 years later. It's at 1500 B.C., okay? It's promised to 2000 B.C. Not, it's, for five, it's 500 years later before they actually begin to realize that promise before God brings them out of slavery and into the promised land. Now, before we read about this, this is, I think is really important, but I want everybody to stand up and uh, take a minute, uh, shake somebody's hand, walk around a little bit, say hello, introduce yourself if you don't know each other. <clears throat> take a breath, do some jumping jacks, some push-ups if you want to. Good for you. That's fabulous. 
<laughs> That's fabulous. That's outstanding. Okay, let's look at what stopped the children of Israel from going into the Promised Land in the first place. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 14. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers chapter 14. <clears throat> and let's actually just read this record. Um, you, again, I shared this early on in, uh, it was either Joshua 1 or 4, I don't remember, but the actual journey from the land of Goshen, which is where they were in slavery in Egypt, that's where they lived, to the Promised Land. The book of Deuteronomy in chapter 1 says it. It was about two weeks. It, took about, it would take about two weeks to get there, right? So you go from land of Goshen over to the Promised Land, two weeks, there's the Promised Land, you go in, we're done. But the children of Israel, for the reasons we're going to read about, didn't do that. And the reason we're looking at this is the children of Israel had a promise of God. It was... Um, it was a gift by God, that is to say the promised land was, I'm going to give this land to you, but it wasn't going to be without effort. He was going to give it to them. Even in Joshua chapter 1, one of the first things he tells Joshua, and we'll read more about this a little later as well, is he says, be strong and have a good courage. Well, there's a reason why he said that. Because for years, more than a decade, you know, 15, whatever, he was fighting 31 kings worth to take this promised land, to do what God said to do. It wasn't, the, the inhabitants of the land didn't say, okay, fine, we'll leave, you go ahead and have the city. No. God gave them the promised land, but they had to fight for that. We have a similar situation with Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. We have a promised land too. Now, I'm drawing an analogy that I will be the first to say there's not a verse in Scripture that I'm aware of that says Joshua is like Ephesians, okay? Or that Ephesians is like Joshua. But there are some similarities between those two books in that Ephesians talks about our salvation and our standing in Christ and how we actually bring that into fruition in our lives, how we realize the promise, so to speak, in our lives. Joshua and the children of Israel were the same way. There was a promise. There was, I'm going to give you this land, but then there was, you got to fight for it, okay? So we're looking at that a little bit. We're going to look at the historical details of the chapter probably next week, and um, hopefully some apologetics type of things, like the sun standing still, or the hailstorm, or the fact that Joshua, that Joshua acting on what God said killed everything. And I mean everything. It says everything that breathed, he killed it. Because that's what God told him to do. We'll read about that actually in Deuteronomy 7. He was performing God's will. But um, some people have a real objection to that. So we'll, we'll look at that. So anyway, let's read Numbers chapter 14, verse uh, 22. Um, okay, so uh, verse 22, because, in Numbers 14, 22, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, this is God speaking, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times. You can look at those if you want to. We're not going to go through them, but there were actually ten times that they were tempted, that God was tempted by them. They were tempting God, so to speak. <clears throat> and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit in him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Let's skip down to verse 32. This is again God speaking to these men who chose to not believe his gift of the promised land, that they decided they couldn't do that, right? That was essentially what happened. Ten of the spies of the twelve they sent, ten of them come back and say, we cannot do this. This is out of our league. We can't do this. So basically what they're saying is they were calling God a liar. Because God said, go take the land. I'm going to be with you. I'll fight for you. I, you just saw it in Egypt. I brought a million and a half of you out. I did at least ten miracles that we can read about, right? I've fed you miraculously since then. I can take care of the promised land for you. Believe me, I can. These ten guys come back and say, we can't do this. And, of course, the children of Israel, 
you leave the ten guys. Not Joshua and Caleb that come back and say, we got this, man. God's going to fight for us. We got this. Ten guys say, no way. So they believe the ten guys. That's why they don't go in. But let's read about what God thinks about those people that disbelieved. Verse 32. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you search the land, the spies went into the land for 40 days, okay? After the number of days you search the land, 40 days, each day for a year shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation. Okay, so they disbelieved, they wander around in the wilderness, right? That's the reason they didn't go in in the first place. Remember, two-week journey, and they could have been there. They chose not to do that. So they wander in the wilderness, which figuratively frequently happens to us when we don't believe God's word. We end up wandering in the wilderness. And some people, their whole lives, you know, it could be 40 years. It really could. So additional 40 years of wandering, that brings us to about 1450 B.C. I give you the dates just so you have some kind of an idea of kind of, you know, what history we're talking about. Promised land, 500 years later, they're realizing it. And then 50 years later, they're actually going into it, right? They're actually going into the promised land. And then uh, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 3. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 3. Uh, Joshua is the one that's actually, and we'll read about this here, is actually going to be the one that brings them into the land, um, not Moses. And I don't begin to fully understand. I mean, I know what the Bible says about why Moses didn't go in, but I don't fully understand that. I mean, I will be the first to say I don't fully understand that. Um, but not that I need to understand everything in God's word, of course. Yeah, correct. For, yes, for, for essentially it was kind of disrespecting or disbelieving God. I mean, that's essentially what it was. So anyway, we'll look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 21. And I commanded Joshua at that time. This is Moses speaking. The whole book of Deuteronomy pretty much it happens in one month, the 11th month of the 40th year, and it's Moses speaking the whole book. It's great. It's like you're sitting down and having a conversation with Moses. It's fabulous. I really encourage you to read it. Anyway, verse 21, And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. He's uh, referring to the um, Og and Sihon, I think. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither you pass, thou passest. You shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. Already he's telling Moses, you'll not fear them. What does that mean? That that's a real possibility that he's going to fear them. Otherwise, Moses wouldn't be saying that. Otherwise, in Joshua chapter 1, God wouldn't be saying, be strong and of a good courage. Because what you're going to do is going to take being strong and of a good courage. Or he wouldn't say that, right? This wasn't, this wasn't going to be pretty. The promised land was not going to be pretty. And Joshua was going to need to be strong and of a good courage in order to pull it off. <clears throat> And I besought the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand, for what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth, angry with me for your sakes, and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee. Speak no more unto me of this matter." Get thee up into the top of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes westward, and northward, and southward, and eastward. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not go over this Jordan, but charge Joshua, and encourage him, and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. So, Moses didn't go, Joshua did, but you can see from the start, Joshua was going to need to be strong and have a good courage to do this. And then the last thing we'll read about this part, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, is what this was going to look like. Um, again, Deuteronomy is right before Moses' death, right before the, they're going into the promised land. So this is sort of what this is going to, you know, here is where we see God's commandment to um, not spare anyone. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. <clears throat> When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, 
and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. Now God specifically tells them, these guys are stronger than you are, right? You need me to do this. He specifically says that to them. <clears throat> and when the Lord thy God shall deliver thee, them before thee, you shall smite them and utterly destroy, utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shall you make marriages with them. Your daughter that you shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. Now, the only thing I want to point out, and we're not going to go into it anymore, but from what God says by way of Moses to the children of Israel, right there, you can see what the people of the land were doing, right? Because he specifically tells you, destroy their altars, cut down their images, cut down their groves, burn their graven images. You can see that idolatry was rampant, including sacrificing kids, including licentious sex as part of a worship service. That was all alive and well in Canaan, right? So God says, the only way to deal with this, um, the analogy I actually thought of, <laughs> I won't look up the scripture because I don't want to take too much of your time here, but um, there's a scripture in uh, 1 Timothy uh, Paul is talking to Timothy and he says um, to um, foolish and learned questions avoid um, they, do, they do gender strife but then he says um, their word it's, it says in the King James their word will eat as doth a canker the word canker is cancer okay? it's actually the Greek word gangrene in any case the analogy that I thought of is if, you, if a person is diabetic one of the side effects of diabetes is that it affects your circulation it, your circulation is, is poor because of it, typically. It's a side effect, right? So, and I've worked with patients, I'm a physical therapist, so I've worked with patients that this has actually happened to them. So let's say that you're diabetic and you have um, another condition that diabetes often causes is called peripheral neuropathy. The nerves don't work right, right? So the nerves don't work right, circulation's not good, right? So let's say you're diabetic and you are sleeping at night, you get up to go to the bathroom, you go to the bathroom, because you have this, your nerves aren't working right, you step on just a little, some, you know, a jack that your kid left on the floor as you're going to the bathroom. Now, your nerves don't work right, so you don't feel that, right? So you just keep going. So when you come back and you go to bed, you know, in the morning when you get up, you got blood all over the sheets. What's that from? Oh, wow, I didn't even feel that, right? So a sore develops, right? Because you just stepped on a jack and it cut your foot. So because your circulation is impaired, it doesn't heal. It gets infected. Because there's no blood, there's a great verse, Leviticus 17.11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood, right? If a sore, if a, if a wound does not get blood, it will not heal, period. The life of the flesh is in the blood. It's got to have blood to heal. If it doesn't get blood, it doesn't heal, period. If it gets infected, it's going to get gangrenous because they can't fix that, right? If it gets gangrenous, which means living tissue dies, they got to cut it off. There isn't another option. They have to amputate. Most of the amputations in the United States, like 85%, are because of diabetes. Because it becomes gangrenous, you have to cut it off. This is the same thing with the people of, in Canaan. You can't, you know, you don't commingle. It was gangrene. The only way to deal with that is you got to cut it off. There is no other way. Okay, there is no other way. It's not like there's another option. So, anyway. Let's go on. <clears throat> so, again, I talked about the analogy or comparison of Israel's promised land and our promised land. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, our promised land, you know, again, it's, it's salvation or maturity in Christ. Okay? We are promised salvation in Christ. And let's actually read about a couple of these things. Um, I'm going to take you to this stuff. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Let 
we're going to read about original sin. Actually, we're going to read about the original command uh, as to what God told Adam to do. And I'll point out, hopefully, one interesting detail about this verse that you may not know. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, I just want to point out a couple of things. First of all, um, this is one of God's first audible interactions that's recorded. I'm not saying it's the first. It's just one of the first ones recorded. The first thing he does is gives a man a choice. Okay? He says, you can do this, don't do that. Okay? We're not going to look at that anymore, but I just encourage you to remember that. One of God's first interactions with man was that he gave him a choice. Number two, when it says the man, this is an, an instance when an accurate translation is good. The man in, Hebrew, in English, it actually is the man in Hebrew. It says the man. In other words, God was talking to Adam. It means he wasn't talking to Adam and Eve. That means Adam had to tell Eve. <laughs> it says Adam. It says he was talking to the man. And Hebrew has a definite article there, the. Right? So let's look at that. So that's you know, what you know, of course, Adam didn't abide by that. Um, and that was the fall of man, which we're not going to go into the details of that, but that's what happened. So let's look at... Uh, Let's look at Psalm 49, because what that got man into, Psalm 49, what that got man into was a situation of um, being outside of God's will, okay? being unredeemed. In other words, the sentence that when, when God said, you will surely die, that came to pass. I mean, that's how Romans talks about the fact that sin passed upon all men, death passed upon all men, because all have sinned. Okay, so let's look at Psalm 49. <clears throat> this deals with uh, redemption. And this is a great few verses. It's just a ton of truth in these few verses. Uh, Psalm 49, verse um, 6. <clears throat> um, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases forever. Or one translation was that it's forever unachievable. However, you, I'm not saying that's the way it should be, but uh, verse 9, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. In other words, there was no way man could pay for his own redemption. There's no way he could redeem himself back from that penalty in Genesis chapter 2 of, if you do this, you're going to surely die. Man couldn't do that on his own. That's what those verses talk about. No matter the amount of wealth you have, you couldn't pay that debt. That's what Psalm 49 talks about. So again, <clears throat> um, let's look at Isaiah 53. This is part of our promise now. We're promised salvation in Christ. So let's look at Isaiah 53. Again, if anybody wants to read, you know, you're welcome to do that. Otherwise, I'll, I'll proceed. But we're going to look at um, Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. I encourage you to look at this whole chapter at some point. It's the chapter about the suffering Messiah. Um, it's the only place in the Old Testament where Christ's sufferings as such are talked about like this. Um, he's referred to in many other places, but not in this context necessarily. So, Isaiah 53, 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He is Christ. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, like Adam did. We did as well. Okay? And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, could accomplish what man could not do on his own. No matter the amount of man's wealth, he could not buy his own redemption. Christ had to do that. The perfect life that didn't have to die had to be the substitute for the one for Adam when he blew it and suffered that sentence. There was no other way. A perfect man had to be willing to pay that price even though he didn't have to. Okay? So, and again, this is all the Christian's promised land. Like Joshua and the children of Israel, we've got a promised land too, salvation. But then let's look at a couple other things. Um, 
We won't read this scripture. You may memorize this if you've been in SOD here or maybe just in the teachings. Um, Pastor David frequently refers to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Um, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. The Greek word is poema, poem. Uh, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, so we get from just salvation to the good works, right? So, and that's part of our promised land. We have salvation in Christ. He's our Savior. But then we have to transition to, is he the Lord? I mean, we talked earlier about if you're in this church and you're sitting in a pew and you're listening to the teaching, great. And then you're serving in Spiral, great. And then maybe it's in your heart to be a deacon, wonderful. And then maybe it's in your heart to be an elder or pastor, that's great. But it doesn't always go like that, Right? We're supposed to, like a human being that's a kid and growing to adulthood, we're supposed to grow to adulthood. That's what we're supposed to do in Christ. We're supposed to be, the Greek word is, uh, we'll look at it actually. Let's look at it. Um, But it's Greek word, it's the Greek word teleos. We'll look at it uh, here in a few minutes. And it means fully mature. It essentially means fully mature. So just like a kid, you know, you'd never think the kid's going to be born and he's going to stay three months old his whole life. Right. That's going to work, right? No, he's going to grow to be six months and a year, and then he's going to be 10, and he's going to be an adolescent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the goal is fully mature. It's the same for Christianity. That's what we're supposed to do. Jesus is not only our Savior, he's supposed to be our Lord. He's supposed to call the shots. He doesn't just get you out of hell. You know, he's not just a get out of hell free card. He's your Lord, right? That's our promised land just like the Israelites had a promised land in the Old Testament. Um, So their opposition in the Old Testament was the Canaanites. You know, the Canaanite was then in the land. Even in in the time of Genesis chapter 12, it says the Canaanite was then in the land, 2000 B.C. 500 years later, the Canaanites are still there. The Canaanites are the opposition, right? Our opposition is the devil, right? The devil is alive and well if you... Read the Bible, you'll see that the devil is well documented. He's all over the place. So let's look at a couple things. And I'll try to not take too much of your time here. Are we doing okay? Everybody all right? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. just going to point out a couple of characteristics of the devil here, because he's our opposition. Okay? The devil is our opposition. Um, you may think some particular situation in your life, some certain person you have a problem with, you may think they're the opposition. The, the devil is your overall opposition. He simply uses circumstances or situations or poor choices that we make as ammunition to fight us. That's all he does. He'll use all of those things. He is a master. And we'll read something about that. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse uh, 4 uh, at 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So who's the God of this world? The devil. He's the God of... Now, Scripture refers to him as the God of this world. That isn't something I said... That's scripture, revealed scripture, referring to him as the God of this world. Okay? Now let's look at Luke chapter 4. This is in the temptations in the wilderness by Jesus Christ himself. Um, And there's a verse here I want to point out to you, which you may be familiar with, but if not, um, there is again a world of learning in this as far as this world spiritually. Luke chapter... Four, and we'll start in verse uh, 5. And the devil, taking him, Jesus, up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Now, the next verse doesn't say, doesn't record Jesus reprimanding him or calling him a liar. Because Jesus didn't call him a liar. Jesus knew what he said was true. The kingdoms of the world, I mean, the devil, we just read about it in 2 Corinthians 4. The devil is the god of this world. 
The things that happen in this world are, the devil is the big part of that. Not that God can't work, but we handed that authority that we had as man in Genesis 2, if we'd obeyed God, we handed that over to the devil when we disobeyed. So the stuff that happens in this world, have you ever thought about the, um, the Lord's Prayer, right? So the disciples ask him how to pray. So he says, okay, here's how you pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, what does that verse say about God's will being done on earth? Why do we have to pray for God's will to be done on earth? Because it's not. Because it's not. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't tell us to pray for it. Right? He wouldn't. If, it was, if everything that was done was God's will, then we wouldn't have any problems because everything we would be doing would be God's will. Right? If God controlled it. But that isn't the case. So we have to pray for God's will to be done. As Christians, we need to do that. Jesus Christ told us that. Right? The devil is the God of this world. When Satan came to Jesus and said, I'll give you everything. I'll give you the glory of it. It's mine. I can give it to you. Jesus didn't say, you're a liar. He responded with scripture. Now, we're not going to go into that, but that's a teaching in itself as well. Okay? So. <clears throat> and the other scripture I'll point, uh, look at Ephesians. And I'm deliberately having you turn to these things or go in whatever you're using, electronic device, digital, whatever it is, so you begin to know what books are where. So you begin to know what, I mean, if you sit down with somebody and you want to show them God's word, you need to know where it is, for heaven's sake, right? You need to get somebody's eyes on the book. So in order to do that, you at least got to know what buttons to push on your phone, if nothing else. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, and I would encourage you at some point, maybe not you know, tonight and maybe it's not your preference, but at some point I would encourage you to get familiar with a paper Bible. I know that is really, really, really old school. <laughs> and we're talking like dinosaur age, but hey, I would just encourage you to do that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. The prince of the power of the air. That's the devil, right? So the devil is alive and well. The devil is your enemy. It's not, you know, somebody's mad at me at work, you know, I, whatever it is. It's, it, it, of course there are situations, there are people that are going to give you problems. The overall enemy is the devil. He uses situations. He uses people. He uses pleasure. He uses pressure to get to you. But it's the devil that's the enemy. Just like in the promised land, the Canaanites were the enemy. The devil is the enemy. And just like the Canaanites... You can't cohabit with the devil. It's not like, okay, you know what? You sit there, I'll sit here. We'll just maintain our distance. We'll be okay. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. <clears throat> um, so the weapons of our warfare, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The weapons of warfare, and I, we're not going to go into this, but if you think about the first time we see Joshua in the Bible, is in Exodus 17, and he goes to war with the Amalekites, right? right? That's the first time he's mentioned in Scripture. He's a warrior. So then in the, in the context of the book of Joshua, 31 kings wipes him out, right? So Joshua was, I think it's safe to say, a man's man. You know, when he went to battle, he went to kill you. That's the bottom line here. He's going to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and we're not talking about battle where it's not, and I'm not disrespecting any of our military or anything like that, but we're not talking about a sniper hiding in, in um, weeds, camouflaged a mile away, going to shoot somebody. We're talking about toe-to-toe, -to -toe, it's either you or me, either you walk away or I walk away. That's it. That was Joshua. So the weapons of his warfare were physical. I mean, we're talking like sword, helmet, whatever else you've got to have. That's what you used. The weapons of our warfare are not. We still battle for our promised land, but not with physical weapons. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse um, 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So our weapons are not physical, they're spiritual. And we cast down imagination. We essentially, I, you know, the important part, that verse is, is very rich as well, but the goal with Christianity as men of God is that we're bringing every thought captive to Christ. That's what that verse says. But the weapons are not physical, they're spiritual. Okay? We can talk about that another time, but point being, they're spiritual, not physical. Um, we won't read that. Okay, the, and the last one we'll look at here is in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. This is also, it's in the same record of the temptations. <laughs> and again, it's just so full, so rich with spiritual lessons. But look at Luke chapter 4, verse 13. <clears throat> and it says, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. How do you, any other translation you got, how do they, what do they translate season? What does it say? Opportune time. Okay, that's an accurate translation. And that's, that's a good translation. That Greek word is the word kairos, right? There's a couple different Greek words for time. One's chronos, we get like chronography, we get that. But kairos means opportune time. Um, another great use of that word is in 2 Timothy 4, when, you know, Paul's about to die. He's writing Timothy his last letter. And one of the last things he tells him in chapter 4, chapter 4 is the last chapter of that book, he says, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. That's the word kairos both times. When you have a convenient opportunity and when you don't, preach the word. That's a great, that's a great word. And that's exactly what the devil does here. He waits for the opportune time to come back and visit you. He waited for the opportune time to come back and see Christ. That's exactly what that verse says. It isn't that he left for good. He left for an opportune time. And he's going to be back. He is, always oh, yes, is. He always is. So, and that's a great lesson to learn about the devil's tactics. He's going to look for your weakness. What does opportune time mean? For your weaknesses. You know, when you're particularly vulnerable. So. Uh, we'll go through these kind of quick because I'm running over and I apologize. Um, our relationship to God as a son, once we believe in Christ, once we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, our relationship to God as a son of God never changes. It's not like, you know, if I have a son, I'm never not his father, right? If I have a daughter, I'm never not her father. I'm always going to be a father as long as she lives. God's always going to be your father. That doesn't change, right? Once you, Romans 10, 9, 10, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you are saved. It says, thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say, unless, it doesn't say that. It says, thou shalt be saved. Right? So that's salvation. That's the relationship to God. But then fellowship with God can change. Whether you are in accordance with God's will, that can change. Just like in a human family. I mean, I'm, if my son does something stupid, like, which he did, of course. I mean, are we, are we in harmony? No, probably not. Look at John chapter 15. Look at John chapter 15. Jesus says it himself. Our relationship to God as a son never changes, but our fellowship with God, our obedience to God's word, um, that can change. In John chapter 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Right? So we keep his commandments, we abide in God's love. Simple as that. Not rocket science. And just a reminder, again, you know, the first thing we saw, one of God's first interactions with man that is actually recorded verbally, he gave him a choice. You can do this, don't do that. If you do that, that's going to happen. John 15, 10 clearly points out that it, it's, it's our choice to obey the commandments. God's not going to force you to do that. He gave you freedom of will because he wants you to love him spontaneously. He wants you to love him because he's God, because he made you because he gave you breath life, because of everything you've got from him, but not because you're forced. Okay. 
So anyway, um, and then uh, again, we won't go to this, but Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I encourage you to read them. Um, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I just want to point out, verse starts off with, I beseech you. What does beseech mean? Anybody know? It means beg. It means like we're talking bended knee here. I beg you. I beg you to do this. So the creator of the heavens and the earth that speaks everything into being that you see in six days and rests on the seventh, the best he can do to get us to transform ourselves, to renew our minds, the best he can do is to beg you. That's the best he can do. He can't command you. He can't say, renew your mind. He can't do that. He can't do that. He has to beg you to do that. It's a choice. It's a choice. You have to choose to do that. So that's our promised land. That's what, you know, we get the promise of salvation, but then the lordship, the, you know, the, the becoming Christ-like is the full promised land for the Christian. But to get there, you've got to fight for it. It doesn't happen spontaneously. You've got to choose to do that. You know, you've got the Canaanites in front of you. You've got the devil in front of you. You've got to choose to do that. It's not just going to happen by magic. Um, the, I think this is the last thing we'll look at, and it's um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. <clears throat> Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. If you don't know where that is, if you do have a phone, then you're cheating. Ah, I probably, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. Um, just a, a thumbnail sketch of background on Colossians. Um, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians were written when Paul was in prison. It was the, Paul was in prison several times, um, but he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon when he was during the imprisonment that is recorded at the end of, book, of the book of Acts. That when he was in, under house arrest in Rome. He wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, those four books. Okay, so in Colossians chapter 1, and if you read those books and recognize the fact that Paul just went from being uh, captured in Jerusalem, being sent to Caesarea and imprisoned there for two years, um, a, a hard voyage with shipwreck to Rome, and then being under house arrest there, and when you read these epistles, you will be amazed at the guy is just in the heavens for no earthly reason because of what he just went through. He just kind of, if you will, wasted five years of his life, two years in prison in Caesarea. He was in, in Rome in prison for two years, right? Plus all the intervening time, the shipwreck, et cetera, et cetera, which you can read about the last part of the book of Acts, from Acts 21 on. But uh, when you read what he wrote, Anyway, so Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Okay, go. So everywhere we go, we tell everyone about Christ. We warn them and teach them with all the wisdom God has given us. We, we won't present them to God perfect in the relationship to Christ. Very good. Perfect in the relationship to Christ. So the word perfect is the Greek word teleos. I'm not going to burn you with details on that, but it's, um, it means, essentially means mature. In 1 Corinthians 14, 20, we won't look at it, but it's actually translated men. In other words, you know, be full grown. <laughs> it's actually translated that way in, in the English, uh, King James Version, it's translated that way. Um, so the life lesson overall here, I mean, there's a, you know, again, we read about the promised land in Joshua chapter 10 and the fight, the, a portion of the fight for that in Joshua 10, which again, we'll look at a little more next week, but on the analogy of that promised land and they're fighting for it, the Christian promised land of salvation and lordship. You know, we have salvation. We're promised that when we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We believe that God raised him from the dead. But the lordship of Christ, 
is something that we are responsible. Not that God isn't going to meet us in the moment. I don't mean that. I'm not saying we're on our own. But we have to choose to do those things that result in maturity in Christ. We have to choose to do those things. They don't happen spontaneously. If you will, when God works in you, you have to respond to that working if that's the way you want to think of it. You've got to do that. Okay? God can't push you. He doesn't control you. Even, <laughs> even Moses in the Old Testament, when he comes to Moses, Moses has this excuse, this excuse, this excuse. Oh, who am I? Who are you? What are they going to say? What if, what if this doesn't work? You know? Finally he says, okay, that, that's it. Go. <laughs> so the, life, the overall life lesson here is Jesus Christ is your Savior if you believe God raised him from the dead. You know? Of course he is. That's what Romans 10, 9, 10 says. But is he your Lord? To be a Savior means, yeah, you're not going to be eternally damned because you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, right? But did he ever get to be the Lord of your life? The word Lord, very simply in English, means boss. He's your boss. So what he says goes. Did he ever get there? Okay, yeah, just a just minute. Um, no, it's all right. Many Christians go through life. Everybody goes through life without, you know, I mean, Jesus Christ is not the Lord of my life everywhere. He's not the Lord of your life everywhere. But we want to get there, Right? Many people go through life and Jesus doesn't get to be the Lord to any significant degree. He's the Savior, but he's not the Lord. They stay in the pilot seat. And you've got to decide whether, to what degree that's you and if it is, in whatever area, what you're going to do about it.